Hello and welcome to EWTN Pro-Life Weekly, your weekly dose of the top pro-life news and issues, all from a Catholic perspective. I'm Katherine Seltner in our Washington, D.C. studio. Here's what we have for you in this show. A pro-abortion group sues to force the Trump administration to facilitate abortions for undocumented mothers. An expert gives us tips on why we need to stay alert about the rising trend of assisted suicide and this. I want to prove to the world that the disabled and in particular the extremely disabled can have a full, successful, joyful, busy and meaningful life. Don't Doubt Dawn, one woman's extraordinary life may challenge the way you view people with disabilities. But first, our top story, it's considered President Trump's first major legislative achievement. Republicans in the House and Senate pass their sweeping tax overhaul plan. Effective January 1st, the new law will bring the biggest overhaul of the U.S. tax code in three decades. Of note to pro-lifers, the $1,000 per child tax credit now doubles to $2,000, with up to $1,400 available in IRS refunds for families who owe little or no taxes. Senator Mike Lee of Utah co-sponsored the child tax credit proposal with Senator Marco Rubio. He joins us from Capitol Hill. Senator, thank you for your time. Thank you very much. First off, why was the child tax credit so central to whether or not you supported this tax overhaul? This provision was very critical for me and for so many millions of American families who rely on the child tax credit and who can benefit from the child tax credit uh, to receive some relief under this bill. We wanted to make sure that we increase the child tax credit to $2,000 per child and to make it refundable, uh, in this case, up to $1,400, up to the amount of taxes paid, including payroll taxes and payroll taxes withheld by the employer. You've said the previous tax code unduly penalizes parents simply for being parents. Does your proposal change that? Yes. One of the reasons why I felt so strongly that we needed to increase the child tax credit has to do with something we call the parent tax penalty. It's a quirk of the way that the federal tax code interacts with our senior entitlement programs, Social Security and Medicare. Today's working parents pay into the Social Security and Medicare system twice, once as they work and pay their taxes, and again as they incur the substantial costs of raising children. Because of the pay-as-you-go nature of these programs, parents today, as they're investing in their children, are also investing in the solvency long-term of Social Security and Medicare. And this increased child tax credit helps mitigate, offset the impact of this parent tax penalty. How do you foresee the child tax credit helping families who have a stay-at-home parent, for example? Well, this is uh, one of the many ways uh, in which people can benefit. Look, if you're a a working parent and uh, whether you pay a lot in federal income taxes or even if your federal income tax burden itself is zero, but you are working, so you're paying payroll tax, uh, then you've got refundability uh, uh, going into this child tax credit, and this will help you. And to be clear, Senator, does the child tax credit include unborn children? I know that was an early proposal. I believe that made its way in there, and I, I think it, cer- it certainly should. Finally, Senator Lee, on another pressing legislative topic, the Affordable Care Act subsidizes hundreds of plans covering abortion. Now Congress is considering a spending bill to bail out these Obamacare plans, but without the Hyde Amendment. What do you make of that, and would you, Senator, oppose legislation that supports the taxpayer funding of abortion or plans that cover abortion? I would oppose such legislation, and this is deeply troubling. Look, uh, uh, America's top health insurance companies have seen their annual profits grow from $8 billion a year before Obamacare was passed to about 15 or 16 billion dollars last year. Uh, And so there's no reason that I can see for us to take good taxpayer money, uh, hard earned revenue earned by American taxpayers and hand it over to one of the most unsympathetic groups in America, uh, America's large health insurance companies. And so uh, uh, this is very troubling on many levels. Senator Mike Lee of Utah, thank you for your time and have a Merry Christmas. Thank you. Merry Christmas to you. For reaction and analysis, we are joined now by our trusted pro-life expert.
Mallory Quigley is Communications Director of the Susan B. Anthony List, and she joins us now. Mallory, thanks for being here. Great to be here. First off, what's your reaction to what Senator Lee just told us about tax reform? Well, I'm, I'm sure that Senator Lee and all of members of Congress are very relieved to have finally passed this, this tax reform legislation, and, and it is a wonderful thing. It's, it's a life-affirming policy to have increased the child tax credit to allow, um, take off some of that burden of families who are uh, growing, growing and, and um, you know, providing the future for our country and these young children. The Susan B. Anthony List was pushing hard for the child tax credit to include the unborn. Senator Lee said he believes that did happen. Did it? Unfortunately, uh, the unborn child tax credit did not make it into the final bill. We were working with another pro-life stalwart from the West, Senator Steve Daines, who we love from Montana. He was really fighting alongside Senator Lee and others to have that included in there. But unfortunately, because the tax reform bill was passed under reconciliation, so that allows us to um, skip the, the 60 votes that are necessary, but it does make the legislation um, subject to all sorts of other rules at the mercy of the parliamentarian, really, um, to whether different provisions are germane. And so that was ruled out of order. But long term, this is something that we want to see added. We, you know, families, the, the burdens um, that are, the, the costs that are incurred by families don't just start the day the child is born. But this is something that you know a family begins preparing for from the moment that they find out that they're pregnant, and and so recognizing that that families start as soon as the the child is in the womb, we wanted to expand that tax credit and make it so that moms and dads could have the extra money in that first year. Turning now from tax reform to another pressing topic on the spending bill, mm -hmm. Congress is considering a bailout for Obamacare plans, and it does not include pro-life Hyde Amendment protections. Senator Lee said he would oppose it. Can you speak to the importance of the Hyde Amendment? Yes, well, absolutely. I mean, it was a really encouraging, though not surprising to see a, a, such a, a strong pro-life leader like Senator Lee make that commitment. But look, the Hyde Amendment, that is that is the representation of the collective pro-life conscience of our nation. Mm -hmm. We should not, even if you're even if you're pro-life or, or pro-choice rather, mm -hmm. the majority of Americans don't want their taxpayer dollars going to fund elective abortion. And Obamacare has opened up the floodgates of taxpayer funding of abortion, and we certainly shouldn't be bailing out that program and spending more money uh, to, to pay for health care plans that, that cover elective abortion. Nearly 70 pro-life groups, including the Susan B. Anthony List, sent a letter to Congress this week saying they would oppose any spending bill that did not include these pro-life protections. Mm -hmm. What will the repercussions be for congressmen who were to support it? Right. Well, this is something a pro-life Congress simply cannot do. We have pro-life majorities in, in both chambers, and it is critical that we defend the, the line that's been drawn in the stand for really for decades. I mean, the, the Hyde Amendment's been around for a long time. Mm. Um, it's saved nearly two million lives in the last 40 years. So this is very important legislation. And fortunately, um, Speaker Ryan came out very strongly this week and said that the House, which is got an even larger pro-life majority than the Senate, that they simply would not um, accept any language that didn't include the Hyde Amendment. So we're so thankful for his leadership there. That's very encouraging. Mallory Quigley of the Susan B. Anthony List, thank you and Merry Christmas to you. Merry Christmas, Catherine. Pro-lifers, here's an important update from Washington. Congress is debating a spending bill with funding to bail out the Affordable Care Act, or Obamacare but it is not protected by the Hyde Amendment. The Hyde Amendment, enacted in 1976 and passed every year since, is an important pro-life protection. According to research from the Pro-Life Charlotte Lozier Institute, the Hyde Amendment has saved over two million lives. We need to tell Congress we oppose any spending bill that uses funds to cover abortion. We need to raise our voice and say, we do not want our taxpayer dollars going to fund abortion or towards insurance coverage that includes abortion. Here is this week's call to action. Grab your phone or laptop and type in this website, ProLifeWeekly.com. Once again, that is ProLifeWeekly.com. At this website, you can tell Congress not to pass any Obamacare bailout package that does not include pro-life high protections. 
The Hyde Amendment represents our conscience as a taxpayer and it saves lives. Any member who votes for a spending bill with a cost sharing reduction bailout for Obamacare that is not covered by the Hyde Amendment would be voting to use taxpayer dollars for insurance that includes abortion. One thing should be clear, a pro-life Congress cannot open the doors to more taxpayer funding of abortion. Send in your message right now. Go to ProLifeWeekly.com and tell Congress not to pass any Obamacare bailout package that does not include pro-life protections. Once again, that is ProLifeWeekly.com. Turning now to more pro-life headlines, the Trump administration appeals to the Supreme Court after a federal judge ordered the administration to allow two unaccompanied minors who are in U.S. custody to obtain abortions. The administration appealed the judge's ruling for one teenager who is 10 weeks pregnant and did not seek to stop another teen who is 22 weeks pregnant from having an abortion. The two unaccompanied minors, referred to as Jane Roe and Jane Poe, are legally represented by the pro-abortion American Civil Liberties Union. The HHS Administration for Children and Families had previously argued the minors have the option to voluntarily depart to their home country or find a suitable sponsor, but the administration is not required to facilitate the abortion. Ohio lawmakers sent a bill to Governor John Kasich that would ban abortions based on a diagnosis of Down syndrome. The bill would make performing an abortion in such cases a fourth-degree felony and require the state medical board to revoke the physician's license if convicted. Women would not be penalized. A 2012 study found 75% of women pregnant with a child who has a Down syndrome diagnosis terminate the pregnancy. Pennsylvania Democratic Governor Tom Wolf vetoes a pro-life bill that would have banned abortions after 20 weeks. The state's pain-capable Unborn Child Protection Act and dismemberment ban would have banned abortions after five months of pregnancy, the point at which science shows babies can feel pain. It also would have banned dismemberment abortions, in which the unborn are torn limb from limb. The pro-life bill passed the state's house with a strong bipartisan margin of 121 to 70 before the governor vetoed it. We go now to the pro-life headlines around the world. Guatemala's Supreme Court halts the distribution of a pro-abortion manual. The Human Rights, Sexual and Reproductive Rights and Healthcare for Girls and Adolescents manual is funded by the UN Population Fund and has been promoted by the nation's Human Rights Office. But the High Court ruled earlier this month the office must stop promoting abortion and reiterated the office has an obligation to defend life from its conception. An Irish Parliamentary Committee last week recommended a constitutional ban on abortion be repealed. The committee suggested Ireland allow abortion on demand up to 12 weeks. Irish pro-life groups described the recommendation as disgraceful and appalling. And last week, Italy's Senate approves a law allowing Italians to write living wills and to refuse artificial nutrition and hydration. With a 180 to 71 vote, it is seen as a victory for assisted suicide and euthanasia advocates. The Catholic Church teaches euthanasia and assisted suicide are morally unacceptable. Though assisted suicide advanced in Italy, state-level assisted suicide legislation frequently lost this year. But our next guest says we need to remain vigilant about the rising threat of assisted suicide and take precautions to protect ourselves. Take a look at a recent conversation I had with a top expert on assisted suicide. Rita Marker is Executive Director of Patients' Rights Council. She is a practicing attorney in D.C. and in California and admitted to the Supreme Court Bar. Rita, thanks for being here. Thank you. Assisted suicide legislation has failed at the state level in about 27 states mm -hmm. this year. Is it really a threat? Absolutely. Mm. And the thing is that those who are promoting it recognize they might not get it through in a state in one try mm -hmm. or two or three or four but they never give up. And one of the problems is that those on our side who see how dangerous this is for vulnerable people, once the threat is away in the state, they go back to other things, to watching baseball or whatever it may be. But those who are real advocates for doctor-prescribed suicide do not give up. And it is so important for everyone to get involved now. So how can patients protect ourselves? And at what stage should we start thinking about this? Should I be thinking of how I need to be protecting myself? 
you should be absolutely thinking about how you're going to protect yourself mm -hmm. and other people okay. because again this makes all the difference in the world you know it's the sort of thing where some people think well it would just be accepted no it can become expected and that's what it is now I want to mention too that people think of it they hear people say ah but I would like to take a pill and slip peacefully away mm -hmm. that sounds so good but in fact Assume for a minute that you're in a supermarket, okay. that you're, you're at the pharmacy, behind the pharmacy, mm -hmm. waiting for antibiotics. Mm -hmm. You could be behind someone, and you're, I know you're not supposed to overhear things, but right. you often do. And a pharmacist could be handing someone something like this, and it's got 100 capsules in it. And the directions would be, take all of this with a light snack and alcohol to cause death. We're talking about 100 times the amount of barbiturates, that's what they are, that would be given before surgery or whatever, and you know, put all those the stuff from all those capsules in applesauce or in a drink or whatever. So this is a reality, and this is being done in those states I just mentioned. That wouldn't be peaceful, but how do we know? Because these victims have passed away. For our Catholic viewers, should they involve priests in their legal documents to get priests to make sure they're defended and protected? If you ask a priest for legal information, um, that's very nice and it's very unwise Why? because a lot of times the priests don't understand the ins and outs of these and in fact for people who remember the Terry Schiavo case or even those who don't once they find out about it there was one priest that testified in that case mm -hmm. and he testified that it was fine to remove Terry's food and water priests do not spend a lot of time do not understand these issues and so while you may have a you know you want a priest to come for last rites but you don't want a priest to decide what your legal documents should look like. Thank you so much for your insight on this. We do need to keep paying attention to this issue. Yeah. And I want to mention too that people really should go up to our website so that they can get information because at our website, which is mm -hmm. patientsrightscouncil.org, they will find all the information on all of these issues. They can call us and ask for a document, for example, a really good durable power of attorney for health care. Rita Marker, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. When we come back, I would like your viewers to know that they don't need a special degree to interact with someone who has disabilities. We speak directly with an incredible woman who has severe disabilities on what her life is like and what she wants you to know. Stay tuned as EWTN Pro Life Weekly continues after this break. For unto us a child is born. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. As the Advent season comes to a close, we prepare to welcome the infant Jesus this Christmas. Welcome back to EWTN Pro Life Weekly. I'm Katherine Seltner. An online television show both mocked Jesus and twisted Christianity's teaching on abortion recently. In a skit for her Hulu TV show, I Love You, America, comedian Sarah Silverman runs into comedian Fred Armisen in a sandwich shop. Armisen is portraying Jesus Christ in the skit. Silverman asks Armisen a series of rapid fire questions. Here is how Armisen, while portraying Jesus, answered a question on abortion. I'm against it, but that's just me. I'm also against the squashing of the tiniest bugs. So whether or not you squash a bug or kill an animal or have an abortion, that's up to the individual. That clip is not comedy, it's pure propaganda. Sarah Silverman is a public supporter of Planned Parenthood, and she also has a history of anti-religious comments and, quote, jokes. This routine, this goes too far. Any attempt to portray our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as a God who would turn a blind eye to the killing of unborn children is blasphemous. The I'm personally pro-life, but you can do what you want excuse doesn't work on Capitol Hill, and it doesn't work here in this skit. Our Lord is the author of life, and as we remember this Christmas, he too was once an unborn child. He came as a child to save us. You might say, oh, but this is just a joke. No, it's not. It's the abortion agenda infiltrated into our media and a mockery of our Christian faith. It's not okay. We can't accept any instance of it, and we must continue to speak up for life. 
Remember, you can always have a role in countering today's culture of death. Follow this week's call to action at ProLifeWeekly.com. Tell Congress not to pay any Obamacare bailout package that does not include pro-life hide protections. I had the honor of meeting our next guest at a pro-life institute earlier this year, and her witness has stuck with me ever since. Dawn Parcott was born with a form of cerebral palsy. As a child, she was diagnosed with juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, and nine years later, because of a wheelchair accident, experienced spinal cord trauma and more brain injury, leaving Dawn legally blind. But this Catholic woman in her 40s has kept her faith and lived an accomplished life. From becoming the first student with multiple disabilities in the history of Notre Dame, then graduating with her master's, she's also an equestrian and the first Miss Wheelchair New Jersey winner with a speech disability. I sat down with Dawn recently, and because she talks through a computer device, I provided her my questions in advance so she could type out her responses ahead of our interview. Now, meet Dawn Parcott. Hello, Catherine. It is very nice to see you again. It's so good to see you, Dawn. You have delivered testimony against assisted suicide legislation. You are actively working against New Jersey's aid in dying for the terminally ill bill. You believe assisted suicide is insulting. Mm. Can you explain that? My organization, the Climb Organization, and I view assisted suicide as a deadly form of ableism. Like racism and sexism, ableism is an ugly prejudice that society holds towards its disabled citizens. The very heart of the argument for assisted suicide is that an individual may be better off dead than disabled. By extension, these legislators support the premise that some lives are not worth living. But these are the lives we have. Take me for an example. The physicians informed my parents that I wouldn't live a day, and then they said that I wouldn't last a week, and then I would be lucky to survive to five, and so on. Obviously, I proved the doctors 100% wrong. Let's call the legislation what it is, state-sanctioned execution of people who need and deserve our prayers, and our love, and our service to finally find their peace. Don, how has your Catholic faith sustained you in your life? My faith and having a personal relationship with God has gotten me through every one of my difficult times in my life. I was the only student who was on grade level in the whole school. I had to take a lot of school work home to keep up with my goals. While other children were ending their school day, at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, I was just starting my day with my studies and therapy at home. I felt very lonely. I had no one to talk to besides God. In my head, I had several conversations with our Heavenly Father about how unhappy I was. I asked the Lord over and over again to assist my parents in getting me out of the school. However, in 1988, I had the biggest setback of my life. I slid off a cliff in my power wheelchair while I was helping a brownie troop to camp. I fell into a deep depression, and I had enough, just like anybody would. However, thanks to my family and friends, I got through the depression. Even though I was extremely angry at God, but deep in my heart I believed our Lord would show me the right road back. I believe that God never gives me more than I can handle. Although, I wish the Lord would stop showing me that over and over again. You have a very successful personal life as well. You've been a competitive equestrian and beauty pageant winner. You've also been proposed to by three men. Why do you think this is important to share with people? The reason I want people to know about all of my success is, is because of the world views individuals with disabilities not as human beings, made in the image and likeness of God, but as inconvenient things for people to cope with. 
I want to prove to the world that the disabled and in particular the extremely disabled can have a full, successful, joyful, busy and meaningful life, if they are given a true chance. By the way, I would like to make it clear to the audience that I 100% chose to be single. For the meantime, having the freedom and the time to do this work is more important to me. It's a beautiful vocation. Don, you may be the only person someone knows who has a form of cerebral palsy. Maybe the only person someone knows who uses a wheelchair or speaks through an electronic device. Do you find people don't know how to interact and engage with you? And if so, what would you want to tell them? I find some individuals aren't sure how to deal with me. In fact, I would like your viewers to know that they don't need a special degree to interact with someone who has disabilities. The next time they see a person with a disability, they may include them in a conversation. They may share a joke or the latest gossip. The finer things in life are not just five-star restaurants and front row center tickets. The truly finer things in life are being part of a community. I would like to tell your viewers, if their children stare at someone who has disabilities, it's more than okay, we know we look different. When I see a parent getting upset with his or her child, for staring at me, or asking why I'm in a wheelchair, it truly bothers me a lot, because all that the parent is doing is making their child afraid of me. We know those are questions we ask each other. Don, it has been a joy to speak with you. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. If you want to follow Don's work, you can like her on Facebook at The Climb Organization, Inc. That's it for this edition of EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. I pray you all have a blessed Christmas and encounter Christ's coming as an infant child. What a miracle and a message for our time. Next week's show is a special Pro-Life Year in Review, so be sure to tune in. And until then, you can reach us at ProLifeWeekly at EWTN.com. Life is a gift. Your life is a gift. God bless.